In today's episode, I will play as Prussia in the 19th century, a time when European powers aimed for dominance over Europe and the world. This means two things. First, I'm playing Victoria 3, finally, because the new DLC sphere of influence is out. Second, I will strive to unite the divided German states into one Germany, more precisely into a super Germany by convincing Austria to submit to me. This won't be an easy task as Austria is a great power and a rival to Prussia in the quest to unite Germany. Therefore, I will have to defeat the Austrian armies on the battlefield to humiliate the country. Other European powers like France, Russia or Britain might intervene since a super Germany is a threat to them. I will record the episode in a semi-guide style, explaining what I know and hoping for your comments on what I don't, where I will create the Holy Roman Empire or actually something else. Welcome imperialists Lucas here. In my campaign, it will definitely help that Prussia is one of the most powerful European powers with a large modern army. Technologically, Prussia is probably the third best country in the world. The literacy rate is also high, making it easy to find qualified workers for my factories. Further industrialization will positively impact my budget, which is not very large at the moment. Reforming Prussia will take some work, but that's good it will be more interesting. Fortunately, I was already the leader of my own power block, the Zoll V Rhein or German Customs Union, which has two very strong principles, more efficient factories and reduced police institution costs. This will help me ensure the safety of German citizens. Therefore, I decided to introduce specialized police in Prussia as soon as possible, which will please a large part of society. I must admit I am counting on a stroke of luck in implementing this law. Initially, I focused on inventing better boilers, which will make my minds more efficient, then pharmaceuticals and nationalism, although we know that nationalism in Germany can end badly. I am a trade league and want only open borders. In terms of building industry, its civilian part will definitely be in Silesia for several reasons. First, we already have bonuses to mines and infrastructure here. The raw materials are also abundant here, which is important due to the new local price mechanics. I will explain this with the example of tools, which initial production I have in Westphalia. At the current level of technology, I need steel and wood to produce tools. Wood in Westphalia currently costs 25 and in other areas it is even cheaper, giving an average market price of 23,2. I use 157 wood to produce tools, which cost me 3,900. My calculations show that the total production cost in wood is the local price, not the average from the Prussian market. I then built some sawmills in Westphalia, which lowered the local price and ultimately the production cost. Therefore, it is initially worth creating entire production chains within one province if possible. The last major advantage of Silesia is its large population, meaning more happy workers. In Anhalt, I will build the furniture industry because I have many sawmills here. In Berlin, I will continue to develop universities as I already have four here, with a goal of having 20. As for textiles, it will also be Silesia, as I already have eight factories here, along with some cows. Therefore, I first built a few construction centers here and issued a road maintenance edict, which will also affect the speed of construction. Regarding my area of interest in the world, I am interested in Southern Africa because there is a lot of gold here and China from where I need to get cheaper grain because I lack a lot of it on the market. I will import a lot of wood and other basic raw materials from Russia. I will also improve relations with Russia and Britain on the international stage. The Ottoman Empire will be a profitable rival for me. I will also try to win over France, but to be honest, I have slim chances. Very slim. I also taxed services and raised taxes so as not to be too much in the red. As Prussia, I also have two very important entries in the journal. The German national identity, related to nationalism, but I don't have much influence over this because all German states must actually implement it. What I did have influence over was the Schleswig-Holstein issue. I had to liberate this duchy from Danish rule, which I managed to do immediately as the Danes immediately liberated this province. Incredible luck. Then I changed production methods to more modern ones or those that suited me better at the time. I set up the state administration solely as secular, I also stopped supporting the clergy and focused on promoting entrepreneurs. And I think I was punished because the king died right away. The new one is bald. Of course, in Danzig, I am expanding ports and will build civilian shipyard industries here for now. Then there will also be military ones. 
because Danzig has a bonus for that. Honestly, one of the best changes for me is this side panel that we can now freely adjust and to have an overview of all the factions I have. Or lobby? Oh, I already have some established at the beginning. Lobby are new associations in which a political group can operate. They can be for or against a country. For example, here, the intelligence set up and supports a pro-British lobby. And now, if we take the following actions, intelligence will either be pleased or not. Lobby can be formed in two ways. When we take diplomatic actions with a country, it is random and will be either for or against. Or we can take such a diplomatic action, but it often involves a large financial expense Lobby can also occasionally commission a mission to make it easier, for example, to form an alliance with a country or to force us that another country is our rival. But then we get more diplomatic influences to speed up the legislative process. I increased my authority 25% always prop. I also received information that the British King died and Queen Victoria ascended the throne. And actually, I envied this ruler for the British. Fortunately for me, this means that Hanover fell from British influences, now I can either conquer it to make it my protectorate or join it through diplomacy to my customs union. If anything, conquest is usually much easier. I will be able to invite Hanover to my block of states only when I have enough diplomatic pacts or very strong trade relations with it. The problem, however, is that besides me, other blocks of states will also compete for this country. Sometimes it's really annoying. That's why I started my diplomatic action with Hanover with a little bribery. Meanwhile, I established the law for a better police force. Then I focused on establishing this secret police. After all, I must defend German democracy. German diplomacy really had a lot to do to peacefully unite Germany. And the secret police will secure the rear at home. Well, it's safer right away. Setting cultural exclusion will be very important for our trade league. As bad as it sounds, it's really good law because practically its introduction will mean that we will accept most European cultures and those more Western ones. After three years, I could also set further rules for my trade league. There are quite a few of them here, but I decided on technological development first. It was important for my very peaceful Prussia to develop civilian navy. This allowed me to import more wheat from China to Germany. I also modernized the Prussian army. Firstly, I improved the cavalry and secondly, I started recruiting artillery battalions. It's currently very important. Artillery is the only type of troops that has a certain special modifier. Cavalry has very little and infantry at all. And why it's so important, I'll tell you at the first war. During a few years of my diplomacy, I practically managed to convince Hanover to join my block of states. If the British don't spoil my plans, unfortunately they can also work here. My fourth expansion of the trade league will be the colonial office. It allows us to generate 50% less aggressive expansion when conquering unrecognized powers, which means most countries worldwide. I finally concluded trade agreements with Russia because I needed to acquire cheap raw materials. Oh, France has fallen and become a republic and Hanover has joined my block of states and the customs union. It's probably the only peaceful way to join the customs union. After several years, we were on the verge where most German states developed the idea of nationalism. Although I'm not sure if the world should celebrate, the idea of German unification became very close to us after a while. In reality, it now requires me to become the leader of German unification. I also enlisted most of the region's states into my block of states, but honestly, I'm not sure what that gives me, aside from a common market, of course. Returning to the grand game of German unification, I actually wanted to weaken Austria significantly earlier by conquering Czech lands first, humiliating them and collecting war reparations. This region is one of the richest Austrian provinces, accounting for 11% of their GDP. Plus, I'll take away 30,000 troops, which will really knock Austria off its feet. Fortunately, this was mainly a war between Austria and me. Since Prussian and Austrian armies were fairly comparable in number, I ordered all my generals to defend. This was because my army was mainly superior in defense, resulting in fewer losses during defensive battles. Currently, manpower is the most important statistic for your armies, as it renews very slowly. Recruitment speed depends on the training method chosen, but it's very slow at this stage of the game. In this battle stage, 
Austrian losses are twice as high as mine. If this trend continues, Austrian armies will soon consist of empty regiments. The speed at which manpower burns out is influenced by kill ratio. After the first battle, my frontline advantage increased to 14%, having started evenly matched. And after months of fierce fighting, Austrian armies are practically exhausted. Despite the claim of having 177 battalions, they realistically field around 40,000 troops, whereas I command nearly 200 in my army. This was the moment I shifted to the offensive. You can see it from how we initiate battles. Despite a comparable number of battalions, Austrian armies were significantly weaker in reality. Breaking through the front line will now be much easier. In the next battle, supposedly 42 battalions, but they began with 23,000 troops, 70 battalions, but realistically, only 25,000 troops. We have doubled the numerical advantage as Prussia. Honestly speaking, our opponent stands no chance. Austrian armies literally collapse under artillery fire. After a while, I won the war and conquered Czech lands. Now I just need to establish my administration here. I also started privatizing most of my companies to increase the number of capitalists in my country without a doubt. As you can see, I'm moving towards the laissez-faire. After five years, I could start the real game of unifying Germany and taking leadership. Austria has no powerful allies supporting it. Very good. I could have counted on British support in this war, but I really didn't need it. Also, there was a risk that if Great Britain intervened, Russia would stand on the opposite side. Similarly to before, in most cases I defended myself, waiting for the Austrian armies to burn out. Although, they were already exhausted at the start of this war. The Austrian army simply stood no chance. Within months, I gained the advantage on the front line, and now I can command my armies to attack. A year later, I had such an advantage on the front line that I didn't have to think about anything anymore. The war was basically won. This allowed me to establish the Prussian Federation of States. Honestly, I care more about this prestige than the popularity of my ruler. Maybe. Thanks to this, Northern Germany was unified, except for one state as it was the Austrian protectorate. I won't hide that at this point there was quite a bit to manage, from changing production methods wherever possible to those I already have set up. Sorting out trade routes, there are a lot of annoying things to do. I also had to reduce taxes because my radicals have significantly increased and taxes have a big influence on them. After creating the North German Confederation, the next step was improving relations with Austria, which wasn't easy after taking Czech lands from them. Finally, I'm conducting a vote on changing the voting system in the country. The richer someone is, the more influence they have on the country. Changing this law will greatly strengthen the industrialists. Luckily, all territories are incorporated, so I have full tax revenues except for Czechia and Moravia, which I conquered. Therefore, I'll need to build a lot of new offices in Berlin, which seems to cost a fortune. I need to get cheaper paper. I also noticed that I once again confused the internal affairs institution because this with the colonial institution due to the very similar icons, except here it's about money. <coughs> colonies in Africa are crucial for my future plans, though Argentina could serve as a retirement plan. After the first free elections in my parliament, conservatives and libertarians are taking seats. This will be interesting. I've also introduced a more modern economic system, which will positively impact the pace of private sector development. As for the pace of building the public sector, I'm hardly constructing anything myself anymore, but the private sector is thriving. However, I'm not sure if it works better than in previous patches. Additionally, I've allowed British and Swedish investments in my country, influencing who owns factories. Some of my tool factories are owned by Great Britain, some by Scandinavia, some by my merchants and some by my state. Overall, having these factories in foreign markets means I don't receive dividends from them, this exact amount. However, the owners still pay taxes. My block of states has also developed a third level of colonial office, reducing the risk of conflict with most countries in the world by 50%. That includes all countries ranked up to 40, that's around 160 countries or so. Let's check this out. Without this office, conquering provinces cost me 11 points. But with the office upgraded, infamy decreases. Nice. I think I need to refresh the World Conquest episode from Victoria 3. Nonetheless, I established a foothold in Zulu in Africa. 
after implementing colonial law, I began establishing German colonies everywhere. Of course, they are exploitative, others aren't profitable. Thanks to combining high literacy with this development in state research, it was profitable to build many new universities. My research speed is simply amazing. I should have three years of research here, not just 16 months. Unfortunately, socialist ideas have gained ground in Germany during this time, trade unions and such. I won't give in to them. After smaller wars, I managed to acquire several gold mines in Africa. I also issued a special decree here to increase its extraction achieving over 60% efficiency, but I must build my special building for that to be possible, which reduces the cost of decrease, among other things. At least it used to, right? Since my markets are unfortunately very short of dice, I decided to conquer Madagascar, or rather make it my protectorate. The local population was very pleased with the spread of German culture. However, the landing technique was very strange, no matter it led to victory. I also remembered to introduce public health care. After many years of effort, I managed to discover rubber, but that's not what it was about. I invited Sweden to join my block of powers. I also obtained the right to invest in industry from the Russians and used it to build gold mines in the Urals. I'm curious who will profit from this and by how much. Honestly, the Russians made a profit from it. Investing in gold doesn't pay off, I think I only get dividends. <coughs> As I grew closer to convincing Austria to support me in the German unification game, I also began to improve relations with the remaining German states that haven't yet backed me. Meanwhile, another revolt erupted in France and a civil war between the French Republic, somewhat reduced, and the French religious revolt. I managed to separate the state and the church. It also became possible to establish commercialized agriculture, increasing the private sector's investment in fields. Considering my ongoing issues with grain and canvas, importing from every country in the world, it seems I can barely get enough from anyone else. So this law might come in handy. Maybe. Meanwhile, institutions in Germany were practically maxed out. I could have introduced new construction methods, but frankly, I couldn't afford it. Unfortunately, there was a change in power, significantly reducing my chances of enacting new agricultural laws. I also had to send my army into minor conflicts in Africa, where local troublemakers rebelled. Though in some, it's a good thing, as it allows me to conquer Africa faster, and now we have an orange revolution in France. In 1870, I finally managed to convince Austria into supporting me in the German unification game. Yes, I literally had to bribe them. This left me with a small budget hole, but it allowed me to pursue the game for a powerful super Germany. France didn't seem to like this as they opposed me and I will have a war with France. However, to be honest, I don't predict France will win this war and regardless, I'm twice as big now. But now, during the pause, I had to handle many issues again. Modernizing the army, reorganizing it, changing production methods again, and then adjusting them anyway, because now there's too much iron, wood, steel, and practically all basic goods on my market, and I'm short on some. Additionally, besides taking Alsace-Lorraine, I'll take war reparations from the French and Lorraine, because why not? There are quite good resources here. For now, I had a significant advantage on the French front, practically 50%, so I ordered my armies to attack. Crossing the river will definitely advance our invasion. After one victory, it was clear the French armies received reinforcements. I was pleased to see the French make the same mistakes as our previous opponents, attacking when they should have been regrouping. I withdrew one army briefly from the front to upgrade it. Now it just needs to wait until it reaches maximum of this bar to be most effective. I'm curious if this will lead to fewer losses. After several victorious battles, the German troops finally broke through the front lines, allowing my armies to advance towards their war goal, Paris, which I forgot to set. The French armies couldn't fill full regiments anymore, and I feel my cavalry is causing them massive losses at the end of battles due to panic-induced retreats. Well, it seems larger armies do make a difference. Look at how France burns. Smoke fills everything here. Perhaps it's my ruler lighting a pipe, creating such a haze that it's smoking up the entire lobby and the game too. It seems I have a heat problem. Clearly, the French stand no chance against me. They lack artillery and cavalry, relying solely on infantry. It's fascinating how you can see whom you're fighting on the board. Although in this battle, I'm puzzled because if you look here, Paris is here, Germany is here, and I'm on the wrong side of the riverbank. See this, there's nearly 300,000 of my fully organized army on the front, opposed by 200,000 French, though realistically, they number about 20,000. Well, a bit more. In the decisive battle for Paris, 200,000 of my troops face off against 53,000 remaining French forces. Capturing Paris effectively means this war is won. My German coalition not only won this war, but also established Greater Germany. Oh, right here. 
It's all thanks to the policy of a great king, propelling Germany to become the foremost and most powerful empire globally, the largest economy, the highest prestige and the mightiest army. Though I'm also able to construct strange discontented faces. Admittedly, my grand powerful Germany now faces several other problems, 26 million problems to be precise. Nonetheless, I must overcome these challenges on the road to shaping Central Europe. Though, who knows, perhaps I'll conquer much more than what's required here. Yet, I foresee the biggest challenge will be toppling the monarchy. But in this episode, I ousted the Austrian Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire to introduce Hussite Bohemia in his stead. 